In October of 2017, the sudden disappearance of Livia Lone Bear sparked widespread searches across most of Western North Dakota. But with many complexities to local jurisdiction, it would take months of slow progress before an unexpected searcher finally had enough. And the discovery that she made was much closer than authorities had expected. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening folks. My name is Adrian, and welcome back to another video by Coffeehouse Crime. Today we're looking at the case of Olivia Lone Bear. Now today folks, we're experimenting with my content a little bit. Back when the channel was very young, I made espresso cases, stories delivered to you in less than 10 or 15 minutes. Espresso cases are reserved for stories that don't quite have enough information to cover 25 minute length videos, but this case is one I've wanted to cover for a very long time. The case of Olivia Lone Bear is partially unsolved, but it does bring a great deal of mystery and intrigue, and even more so, it delivers a very powerful message. And just to let you know that I post solved, unsolved, and strange cases here weekly. So if that's your kind of thing, please consider subscribing to Coffeehouse Crime. So please, grab yourself a coffee and take a seat. This is the case of Olivia Lone Bear. Today, we are travelling to the far north of the US. With an area of over 70,000 square miles, you would be surprised to learn that North Dakota is one of the least populated states in America. And with just over three quarter of a million residents calling this place home, there is a tremendous amount of wilderness around its people. There's a huge amount of precious history around this area too. Its indigenous folk have been living in what is known to be North Dakota for thousands of years. The Mandan people settling here dates back as far as the 11th century, with the Hidatsa arriving a few hundred years after. The Arakara would eventually find their place here too, and these three groups of people would form the three affiliated tribes. European Americans began to settle in Dakota territory from around 1738 onwards. There is a lot to say about the next few decades after this, but in short, the north and south of Dakota would eventually split into two separate states. During the late 1970s, North Dakota experienced a boom in oil exploration, with thanks to an increased demand for the commodity. This brought a lot of money and people to the area, which of course is good for business and development. But the indigenous folk of Dakota suffered greatly from this, losing their land, values, and even people. Found towards the northwest of North Dakota, we find the city of Newtown. Newtown is located at the heart of Lake Sakakawea, and found within the Fort Berthold Reservation. And although I did say city, Newtown only has a population of 2,700 residents. Known for its hunting and fishing spots, Newtown also has incredible scenery and is home to many indigenous folk. And it's here that we find the home of Olivia Lone Bear, a mother and proud member of the three affiliated tribes. Born on October the 11th, 1985 to her father Harley and mother Iris, Olivia spent most of her life in Newtown. She graduated from Four Feathers Head Start in 1991, before attending elementary and middle school in Newtown, where she enjoyed sports such as basketball, volleyball, and cross country. Moving into adulthood, Olivia held various jobs around the community. She worked at the Four Bears Casino and Lodge, and enjoyed working at the Edgewater Golf Course and Legion. Spanning over the next 12 years, Olivia would also become a mother, welcoming Haley, Caleb, JC, Layla, Dane, and Brody into the world, all of whom she loved dearly. Olivia was also a very sociable person, and occasionally would meet her friends downtown, and adding her favourite hobbies of golf, poker, and concerts to the mix gave her a very busy and hectic life. But in autumn of 2017, all of that would change. The date was October the 24th, 2017. Olivia decided to meet up with friends at the Ranchman's Bar on Main Street in Newtown. During this time, she was wearing a white camouflage jacket and light blue jeans. After grabbing food and a drink, the young woman eventually left her friends behind to return home. She departed the bar the same way she'd arrived, driving a metallic grey Chevy Silverado 2500 truck. The truck did not belong to her, but she would often borrow it from a friend. It is believed that Olivia made it home, as her wallet, mobile phone, and the clothes she had been wearing that day were all discovered at the property. But after leaving the ranchman's bar, Olivia was never seen alive again. Her silence was quickly noticed. Olivia often kept in touch with her family and friends, so it was rather strange when she stopped responding to phone calls. 
And as the night sky cast itself over Newtown, those closest to Olivia knew that something was seriously wrong. By October the 26th, two days later, friends had started to ask for help in finding Olivia on Facebook. But with no fresh information coming to light, her family made the decision to notify the police. So one day later, she was therefore finally reported missing to the three affiliated tribes police department. Her brother, Matthew, spearheaded the investigation, setting up a headquarters downtown. Several agencies were involved in the efforts to find Olivia, including the Bureau of Criminal Investigations, Tribal Police Department, Bureau of Indian Affairs, Ward County, Williams County, North Dakota Game and Fish, North Dakota Highway Patrol, Tribal Game and Fish, and Burley County. Now, despite all of the available manpower, this is where the investigation becomes complicated. Jurisdiction was the main problem, and in short, all Indian tribal courts do not have enough of it to call all the shots. The history behind this is very long and complex, but essentially, in 1978, the US Supreme Court limited tribal nations of their inherent criminal jurisdiction over non-indigenous people. This means that tribal police are limited in what they can and cannot do on their own lands and, even worse, are limited in prosecuting non-Indigenous people who come onto the land and commit violent crimes. This also means if an Indigenous woman goes missing, the tribal government cannot exercise any sort of police jurisdiction over that crime unless the government knows the suspect is Indigenous too. In short, this makes any sort of missing persons case an absolute minefield to navigate, and many times so much red tape is involved in the case that no substantial progress is ever made. To add to this, several officers within the TATPD were rather unhelpful with the investigation. One officer had reportedly suggested that Olivia had run away and was out on a multi-day party streak. One large area of interest to the one million acre reservation was Lake Sakakawea, and if Olivia's family wanted to search it, they knew they were against the clock. With winter fast approaching, the lake was slowly starting to freeze over. But despite this, authorities were not prepared to conduct a search by boat, claiming they didn't have the right permission or equipment. But many idle police boats were spotted over the following days and weeks, something which, of course, frustrated Olivia's family. In the meantime, family, friends, and volunteers thoroughly searched through the rest of the reservation. They were up against a vast terrain, filled with grassy hills and water. Drones and ATVs were used, camps erected, and social media was ablaze with tips. But nevertheless, nothing was found. It was around this time that the Lone Bears decided to partner up with a local amateur detective, who goes by the name of Lissa Yellowbird Chase. And Lissa's story is very interesting. Formerly a sex worker, Lissa found her true calling in life by looking for missing indigenous folk. And soon after this, she would go on to found the Sarnish Scouts of North Dakota. Now, unfortunately, due to a personality clash with the Lone Bears, they would eventually kick her out of their operations and exile her from helping. But despite this, she persevered with her own efforts. Formerly with the Lone Bears, and now a lone wolf, Lissa continued her own operations and efforts to help find Olivia. And soon, this detail will be very important to the case. By the end of November, family and friends were in despair with the situation. All land efforts had found nothing of value and the lake had entirely frozen over. This means that any efforts to search Lake Sakakawea would now have to wait until spring. Olivia's silence persisted, and the burden of her disappearance weighed down on the Lone Bear family greatly. Yet, despite this, even months after the lake had thawed, authorities still did nothing to initiate a search operation. By July of 2018, Lissa had become both restless and frustrated with the situation. She had come to believe that the lake was holding a very dark and terrible secret from the rest of the community. And so, one night, she and two other volunteers decided to take a look for themselves. Equipping her 14-foot boat with sonar, the three of them systematically searched the lake's bed, moving further away from the shore as they patrolled its perimeter. And then, at 12.26 in the morning, they came across a glimmer of hope and despair. 21 feet underwater, and at the bottom of the lake, Lissa spotted a rectangular shape. With its straight lines, the object was likely to be man-made, and the overall shape resembled a truck. Lissa notified the authorities immediately. She then contacted Olivia's family to share the potentially pivotal news. By sunrise, authorities had taken to the lake and relocated the object that Lissa had found. And after sending a dive team down with a tow system, they pulled the truck to the shore. 
What they found was devastating. Indeed, it was the truck that Olivia had been driving, and furthermore, a body was found seat belted into the passenger seat. Just to highlight here, it was the passenger seat and not the driver's. The vehicle had shattered windows and was covered in silt, but despite being submerged in water for over nine months, Olivia's family were still able to identify her through the tattoos on her body. Eventually, DNA analysis would also confirm it was her. Tragically, the truck had been found only one mile from Olivia's home. Despite the one million acre search, and all of this time, her body was only a short walk away. Although an autopsy was conducted on Olivia's body, the cause of her death was ruled to be undetermined, as no traumatic, natural, or toxicological causes could be found. This likely rules out the possibility of drowning, and to make things even more alarming, she was found in the passenger seat, meaning she did not accidentally drive to her own death in the lake. So, what exactly happened to Olivia? Unfortunately, no one knows, and although she was at long last found, how she died, or who potentially killed her, is yet to be known. Authorities have not ruled out the possibility of murder or manslaughter, and even still to this day, the FBI is still involved. However, it has now been four years since her body was found. Sadly, Olivia's case is not rare or unique to the area. The number of indigenous women that go missing or have been murdered within the Bakken oilfield region is staggering. And furthermore, a lot of these disappearances and deaths rarely receive any coverage in state or national media. Ever since oil extraction was introduced to the area, violence against indigenous women has skyrocketed. And with the TATPD's loose grip on their own local jurisdiction, it does not look like it'll be resolved anytime soon. Many locals in the area speculate that a lot of these deaths are the result of contracted employees who work at nearby oil companies. And eventually, many of these offenders often disappear back to their own home state too. Since Newtown and many other cities have little to no surveillance, and these contracted employees are almost immune to local jurisdiction, they are able to exploit, assault and murder women in the local area. And even worse, they can get away with it. The problem is described as an epidemic, and North Dakota alone has over 125 cases of missing indigenous women. And this does not stop at the state's borders either. Thousands of cases span up through Canada, with the Highway of Tears being one of the country's hotspots. And in the US, states such as Alaska, South Dakota, Montana and Arizona are all rife with these crimes. It is believed that indigenous women are more than twice as likely to experience violence than any other demographic out there. And furthermore, more than two-thirds of these cases are perpetrated by non-indigenous people. With the lack of coverage of this human rights crisis, it is argued that this social phenomenon is just as silent as it is deadly. Many of these disappearances and murders will never be resolved, leaving tens of thousands of more people in despair and sadness. In recent years, more and more of our modern society are realising this crisis. But unless we see substantial shifts in governmental procedures and jurisdiction is given back to local communities, it is unclear how much change we will actually see. Olivia Lonebear's death is good enough reason to see a change to the current law. But when you evaluate similar cases like Savannah LaFontaine Greywind and Jennifer Catchaway, it is easy to see that the opportunity to finally resolve this deadly pattern is being ignored time and time again. Whether we will witness recognisable improvement in the years to come is yet to be seen. All in the meanwhile, more and more senseless deaths and disappearances continue to occur. So, I probably failed on keeping this case under 10 or 15 minutes, but sometimes an important story can't be cut down. But thank you so much for watching another video today by Coffee House Crime. If you found this case interesting or learned something new, then please remember to like the video and subscribe if you haven't yet. So, what are your thoughts on the case of Olivia Lone Bear? Do you think that she was murdered? And if yes, why, how, and who? Please remember to share your thoughts in the comments section down below. And as always folks, I'll be back again real soon for another video. Until that moment arrives though, please remember to stay safe and look after each other. Thank you, and goodbye.